most of you know, I, I usually write novels. That's my uh, that's what I do in the mornings and uh, day in and day out is kind of my focus. But a couple of years ago, I was at I was at a, an event somewhere and I ran into Stephen Potts, who whose father owns Mobile Bay Magazine, and I uh, asked Stephen. I said. You know, what kind of readership does your magazine have? He said, well, it's about 85% women. <laughs> and I said, I've got this stuff. I wrote about the Delta over the last 15 years because I have a camp that I built up there. And ever since I started going up there, I've been keeping this journal. And I wrote about a lot of the, the characters that I met up there and the Delta itself and the nature, but mostly about the characters I met up there. And I said, why don't we run three of those and see if you get some interest from the men. And if it works, we'll just keep doing it. And he said, well, let me talk to my dad about it. And so I talked to his dad, and, and we agreed on it. So we ran those first three, and it seemed to work for them. And then I did that for them for two years. Every month, I would send them a part of my journal from being in the swamp and those years up in the Delta. And it was really nice for me because when I'm working on a novel, it's usually two to three years from the time I start until I see it. So it's a long time. You almost you come to think that maybe people don't want to read this stuff anymore. It, there's so long between the time that a book comes out and the time you see a new one. You don't get a lot of satisfaction. You spend a lot of time alone working on it. So it was really nice to have something I could do every month. And it was a lot of fun because really for the first time ever I was publishing pieces, things that really happened about things in my life down here on the Gulf Coast. And they were so easy to do because it was right there. It wasn't something I was having to make up. So after we did, and there was another part of this too, as a writer you're always trying to figure out ways to sell what you're doing. And so I figured I could publish this stuff in Mobile Bay Magazine, and at the end of two years, I would have 24 pieces that were already pre-polished and edited, and then I could put those in a collection, and I could resell the collection. And it actually worked. I sold the Delta stuff that I did to University of Alabama Press, and that will come out in September of this year. It's called Among the Swamp People. So you're always trying to look at different ways to do things, but that's my next book will be all the stuff I did for them and the things that I didn't put print. I didn't print everything with Mobile Bay, so there'll be a lot more in there that nobody's seen. And so once I came to the end of doing the swamp pieces, they, uh, they said, well, what are we going to do next? And they actually said, why don't you write about your life growing up in, in Point Clear? I think people would find that interesting. So. I started doing that, and I brought my, my first article. I was going to spend a lot of the day talking about, of today, talking about the swamp. But since my mother's here, I thought, <laughs> I would, since she wasn't up in the swamp with me, I thought since she was here, I'll talk a little bit about the Point Clear stories that I've been publishing recently with Mobile Bay Magazine. And then afterwards, I'll take some questions, and you all can ask me anything about any of any of my books. Or uh, I see some some kids here. Y'all might want to ask me about the Alabama Moon movie. And Russ is also here. He has some of my books outside for sale, and I'll stay around and sign those too afterwards. But the um, the thing about growing up in Point Clear was back when I was a kid, there weren't there weren't a lot of people living there year round. It was mostly a summertime community. And mom, being from Mobile, she knew a lot of the people that would come over in the summertime. So whenever they would come over, there I was, since I lived there year round, and I was sort of a default playmate. <laughs> and that's how I got to know a lot of a lot of kids from Mobile, because whenever they'd come to Point Clear, their parents would send them down to the house, drop them off, or I'd go find them. But we'd end up together. <laughs> so I had a whole assortment of people that would come over in these little two-week spurts and, and I'd hang out with them for two weeks and the next guy would come and we'd hang out. So anyway, we'd go to the hotel and we grand hotel, cause mischief, go fishing in the boats, build tree forts, do all the kinds of things you do when you're a kid. And 
at the end of summer, everybody would go home. And at that point, Clear would, would get pretty desolate. It would get cold and windy, and it was just, we were on a long stretch of highway just south of Bailey's Creek. And so you had to spend a lot of time entertaining yourself. I was the oldest of seven, and there were two girls below me, and so the next boy was about six years younger than me. So I didn't really have a, a playmate close to my age. So I spent a lot of time either, uh, you know, making things. We were always pretty crafty. Mom was real crafty, so she taught us a lot of, we had little art projects she would have us do. So we were making things. I was writing stories a lot. I didn't know at that time that I wanted to be a writer, but I like to draw and I like to write stories and I would actually like to make them into books with cardboard. So from an early age, I like to do that. I was also playing in the woods a lot behind the house. The bay was always too rough and windy and cold out there. So we would go across the street and play in the, in the woods. And I would like to make traps and trap animals and. We had a lot of pets. Some of those pets were things I trapped. Uh, I had a pet possum one time named Sally. And I never, Sally didn't, didn't make a very good pet. I could, first of all, I couldn't figure out what she wanted to eat. Because I would try to feed her frogs and lettuce and, and she would just stay in her cage. We had these rabbit, uh, rabbit cages and I had her in one of those and she would just hiss at me. And so finally, I decided I wanted to let her loose, but I couldn't figure out really how to get her out of the cage. Then I just had to kick the cage off of the stand and let her waddle off. Um, I had some wild hogs that I raised. I had, I think, five or six of those, Mom. I don't know how many there were, but I, had, uh, I went hunting one time, and I shot a hog, and it happened to be, I didn't know it, but it happened to be a mother and it had four or five babies with it, and I felt bad, and so I got them all together and figured I'd just bring them home to be with the rest of the animals. And they grow really fast, and they make a lot of noise. So we eventually had to take those to a farmer. I think you actually had to take them to the farmer. But, uh, I had a pet squirrel named Smokey, and Smokey fell out of a tree one spring storm and Smokey, actually, there were two of them, and one of them died, and then one lived. They were just little pink things about this long. They didn't have any hair. And then when he started growing hair, he, it was kind of smoky colored, so I called him Smokey. And we raised him in this chicken egg incubator. And um, he would, as he got older, he moved back into my room with me. And then he would ride around on my shoulder, and then he would ride on top of my head like a weird hat. <laughs> And during the, in the mornings when I would go out to wait for school, but the school bus came down the road and we would go wait for it. And Smokey would go out there with me and then when the bus got there, Mom would take him back inside. And it seemed like that went on for a long time, but I'm, I'm sure it didn't, it wasn't that long. And Smokey, eventually, it was time for him to go wild. So I went out in the yard and started sticking him to pine trees and poking, poking him, trying to make him go up the trees. And he got to where he was pretty good at that. And then the final straw was, I think I had this in one of the magazine articles, but my neighbor two doors down, uh, Miss Broadbeck, was, uh, she was my grandmother's age, and she was out sweeping her porch. And she didn't know anything about my pet squirrel. And Smokey was real friendly. All he really wanted to do was run up you run up your body and get on your shoulder. <laughs> so she was sweeping the front porch in her nightgown. <laughs> and Smokey uh, ran up her nightgown. And uh, I don't know who was about to die first. <laughs> Either she was going to beat herself to death in that room or, or, or beat Smokey to death. And so that was probably Smokey's uh, biggest uh, life-threatening experience. <laughs> Eventually, uh, I made this trap, and Smokey was also always my trap tester. And I made this trap out of some plywood, and the door would, if the animal went in, it would, it would pull on the bait at the back of the box, and then the door would snap shut in the front. And somehow, Smokey got in that thing, and the door slapped, snapped shut and, and broke his tail. 
And so then his tail eventually got rotten and fell off. And so he had this little tail like a greyhound or something that would do like that. And, and that was how I could always find Smokey once he got wild and went up in the trees. I would, I would see him. For one thing, he wouldn't run as fast as the other squirrels. He would kind of stop and, and look at me. And when I would call him, he would hesitate and kind of look. And you could, you could see his little tail doing like that. And, uh, but eventually, his, you know, his memory, I guess, got kind of fuzzy, and he, he, didn't, he didn't stop as much. And, uh, but I hear the squirrels live a long time, so I've always wondered how long he was up there. So I had a lot of those kind of things going on. And some of the stuff I write about in Mobile Bay is about not just uh, the animals in, in our life, but I, I wrote one about Jubilees that's about to come out. And I wrote uh, what it really felt like when we were over there, and the, the winter time especially. Summer, everybody knows what summer's like in Point Clear, but the winters were were so cold over there. Our house was never insulated. Uh, it, it was built by my grandfather back in the 40s, and so it didn't have any insulation in it. It was just made to be a summer home. And so in the wintertime, it had those, those uh, big windows with the lead weights in, in on the inside, and they didn't seal real well. And that north wind would start blowing, and you could hear them rattling. And we had these gas space heaters in the house that sort of helped keep it warm, keep warm, but you had to get within about eight or 10 feet of them to really get any warmth. And in the mornings when we dressed before school, we'd have to stand in front of those things to stay warm. Mom would come through the house first and get us and light the heaters, what, about maybe 15 minutes before we had to get up, and then um, come through again and tell us to get up. And we'd have our clothes in front of the heaters from the night before, and we'd get dressed there. And I just remember the house always smelled like burnt hair. <laughs> you'd, be so, you'd be so cold standing in front of those heaters that the backs of your hair would always be burned. And, uh, so I remember, I have memories like that. And I remember uh, especially the chores you had to do in the wintertime. Like the pipes were always freezing under the house. And that was the worst thing to have to do, was to have to crawl under the house and fix the broken pipes. And Dad, for some reason, I mean, he seemed to always get me to do the crawling under the house part. He taught me how to do it, and then I was always under there. And you never, you always think snakes and raccoons and possums and stuff are going to be under there, and uh, that was another terrible part about it. But other than that, then the, the chores and the and the cold, it really would foster a lot of a lot of them imagination, a lot of time for me to think about stories, and it was a childhood that I think you, you, a lot of people just don't have that kind of childhood these days, and so I can, I can think of a lot of good stuff to write about. Now, when it comes to the Grand Hotel, we spent a lot of time up there. That was sort of the central focus of being in Point Clear, especially in the summertime. And there were a lot of things I didn't print. And the last article I wrote about mischief at the Grand Hotel, when that came out, I got a lot of emails from people about, well, you didn't put this in there, and you didn't put this in there. But there were, and I, I can't even talk about some of the things we did there today. <laughs> but uh, for instance, my dad said, did you, did you put in, why didn't you put in there about um, Uncle Jeff getting in the gorilla suit and jumping up and down in the tree by the lagoon. <laughs> and, uh, and there were a lot of you know pranks like we would go uh, we would always water ski by the by the wharf that they had their fishing wharf and the guests would be out there fishing with their cane poles and they would they would think a ski show was coming by and we would come by and just cut and spray and soak them wet and they'd just be standing there. And it was always about causing mischief at the Grand Hotel. That was, that was a lot of fun. And I think just about every kid who was over there in the summer has, has memories of that. But I, when I think back about, you know, really what, 
what were the main things that that caused me to be a writer. I think a lot of it you're just kind of born with. I think you're just wired that way. And sort of like people who like to play guitar and uh, any kind of, or, or paint, anything like that. I think you're gonna do it anyway, whether you end up selling, you know, getting a book published or being part of a big rock band or, or, uh, or making a lot of money selling paintings. To me, it was just always something I enjoyed doing, and I would probably still be doing it today if if I had not had success publishing books. So, a lot of when I go to schools and talk, a lot of people want to ask me, you know, what do I need to do if I want to be a writer? And that's usually what I say. I think you have to just naturally want to do it first and enjoy doing it, and enjoy doing it enough to where you would probably do it anyway even if you weren't going to get a book published. And I was never a great student. Uh, Miss Weed, actually, I, from my third grade class, I've seen see her, her here for the first time since Bayside. And I was, I was never a great student. Uh, I wasn't a bad student. I made Bs, but it seemed like I never was very outstanding at anything in school except for creative writing because it was what I liked to do. But I always liked to read, and my father always read to us a lot when we were growing up, and I think that was where I got uh, an appreciation for stories when I was younger. Mom was sort of the, the artistic one. I think I got that from her because she was, always had us making things and drawing, and I loved doing those kinds of things. Dad was a little more engineer-minded, and so he would read the stories, and maybe talk a little bit about what they meant, but he didn't really get wanting to write stories. I never think he got. I never think he understood it. I remember when uh, when I sold my first book, Alabama Moon. I uh, I told Dad, I said, uh, you know, Dad, I got this book published, Alabama Moon, and he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, and it's like the real deal. I mean, like in New York and everything. And he was like, really? Who do we know up there? <laughs> After it came, when it first came out, uh, I, I said, Dad, I'm, my book's about to come out, and I'm having the book signing, Page and Pallet. He said, well, that sure is nice of them to do that for you. <laughs> so, I mean, I think he's proud of me for doing it, but he's just never really gotten one to be an artist. You know, he's always kind of uh, stressed me uh, having a, a, a real job, and, and so I studied computer science in college, and I've always tried to, uh, you know, to have a balance between making money and being an artist. Whereas mom would probably just assume me just be an artist, and, and that and everything will work out. She was always encouraging, you know, freedom and um, and you know, the making things and being creative. So it was a good balance to have. And uh, I know lots of lots of these stories, Mom. I probably haven't written any that that have been embarrassing, have I? You don't get embarrassed, do you? <laughs> <laughs> She's still waiting. <laughs> the one about Middle Bay Light, well, I, she really was half asleep. But the thing is, I don't think you really would have cared anyway. It was. Uh, I mean, we were always doing things like that. When I was in college. When I was a, a sophomore in college, I talked the college into letting me go live in the woods for two weeks and survive off the wild because I thought it was going to make a good story and they were going to give me college credit for it. And basically, we were just going to go out there, me and two buddies, we're going to go out in the woods in South Monroe County with just the clothes we wore, bows and arrows, no food, no water, no tent, and we, we did have sleeping bags because it was January. We're going to live out there for two weeks and just live off the wild. Whatever we could kill with our bows and arrows or whatever we could eat. And so you learn real quick what it's like to be a cow in a field. You just have nowhere to go and you just have to stand there in the rain. And we built this, this grass uh, like a lean-to shelter and we spent all day uh, working on this thing. And then that evening it got, uh, it got dark and we hadn't had anything to eat. 
was like the first day of my life I'd never had anything to eat. So I saw this snake and I shot this snake with my bow and arrow. It was the first thing I'd ever killed with a bow and arrow. And we ate that snake for supper. And then we went about three days where we didn't eat anything. And it was, uh, it was getting pretty rough. Well, the school, meanwhile, they didn't know what we were doing, if we were just goofing off at some hunting camp or whatever, but they, were, they started getting nervous about the liability of the whole thing. So they sent mom and dad into the woods <laughs> to tell us to, to come back out, and they would still pass us. And so mom and dad drive into the woods in a four-wheeler, on a four-wheeler, and we're laying in our straw hut, and we're really hungry, starving. And they, uh, mom gets out, and she's like, oh, look at this, isn't this so cute? Y'all have a little clothesline, and this and that. And, uh, you know, this looks like so much fun. And at that point, we were gonna stay the whole time, and we didn't wanna go out, but it was a pretty, it looked like we were gonna die out there. And, and, so she called the school and told them that, uh, she's like, oh, they're just fine. They're just being boys out there. And so that, that's kind of the approach mom to, to a lot of things. And I'm thinking about one that's coming up that I'm going to write about was the time I ran away from home when I was 16. And it was, uh, I don't even remember what I was mad about, but I was mad about something like having to do too many chores or something like that. And, I, uh, I was out in the driveway about to get in, in my car, the, the big yellow Tornado car that I read about a couple months ago. And uh, I've got everything in my car and I'm kind of standing there waiting for mom to come outside because I want to tell her what I'm doing. And so she comes outside and I said, mom, I'm running away, I'm leaving. She said, really, where are you going? I said, I'm going to live out on the river. I've got a tent, I'm going to live out there, I'm going to catch fish and I'm just, I'm just gonna live out on the river. And she said, well, that sounds like so much fun. Uh, you want me to pack you some lunch? I said, no, mom, I'm serious, this is serious. I'm running away and I'm going to live on the river. Okay, well, um, well, if you get hungry, come on back tonight, we're having a big supper. Like, like, mom, I mean, you, you probably don't think I'm really gonna do this, but I'm leaving right now. She's like, okay. So, I drive out to Fish River to this old empty lot my father had out there. It was a wooded lot and there was a, like a dirt, dirt road into it down to the river. So I went down there and I pitched my tent and I called up my, my buddy Archie from Bayman and I said, Archie, come on, I, I ran away from home. I'm living the good life. I got a tent set up. <laughs> Um, get on the phone, start calling everybody, we're going to party tonight. <laughs> so he, he came over and uh, we, about probably five o'clock that evening, all the cars started coming, you know, we're going to have a big party, somebody's got their truck parked and the radio's turned on. And, I mean, I was living the good life, I was a rock star. And, uh, and then that night, and the next morning, you know, we wake up in the tent and it's, uh, you know, he's starting, the locusts are kind of buzzing, and it's getting real hot. And uh, Archie said, you know, I better, I better get on, I better get on back. I gotta go to church today. I'm like, really? You gotta leave? He's like, he's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I, I thought we were running away. He's like, well, I'm not running away. I was just, <laughs> I was just, I was just coming to hang out, but I gotta get to church. It's like, all right. So he left. I'm, I'm sitting there, and um, and mom comes by and they drive up. I see the Suburban drive up and she uh, she gets out and she's got a camera and my brothers and sisters are with It's like the whole family. It's like uh, an event. And uh, she's like, well, I just want to get a few pictures before Archie leaves and show y'all that, oh, this is so great. You got a... And have y'all caught some fish? I'm like, yeah, mom, we caught some fish. We're doing fine. And she's like, well, can I get a picture of the fish? And y'all standing in front of the tent and everything? I said, Mom, no, this is serious. <laughs> and uh, so we got, like, she took some pictures of us standing there and everything, and I'm just, you know, I have this, this I'm just frowning, I don't want to be in the picture. And, uh, and then they leave, then Archie leaves, and it's getting hot. I just sit in the river, I try to catch one more fish, and it's just like a little brim, like that long. 
and, it's, and I don't want to eat it. And uh, so I ended up about one o'clock that afternoon. I started. I, I couldn't even remember what I was mad about anymore. And I started thinking we were going to have. Mom had said they were having steak dinner that night. And, uh, so I finally decided. Well, I guess I showed them. <laughs> so you used a lot of reverse psychology, I guess, in those kind of situations. Uh, but I think I'm going to do. I'm going to write that story coming up here pretty soon. Uh, lots of lots of fun stuff like that. Having so many brothers and sisters, there lots of their stories too. Um, like one I wrote about my brother with the with the dead deer. He had to throw off the Fish River Bridge, or he tried to. And I have to be careful about those though, because I don't know how many of those that they want me to talk about. <laughs> but there was always something going on at our house. There were, uh, you know, people always getting into something. Every and there were everybody always had lots of friends because you were always friends with all your siblings' friends. And me being the oldest, I didn't get to take complete advantage of that. But there were uh, one of the things I, I wrote about in my first article that I remember that stands out a lot about having a big family was we had these inner family yard sales, which were really a, a weird thing. My sister was usually, Alice was usually doing this, but she, after breakfast in the mornings, probably once a week, she had this table set up outside the kitchen. And after you would eat breakfast, she'd walk by the table and she would sell you things. <laughs> and uh, most, most of the things she would sell you were, a lot of them were your things. <laughs> if you left your stuff around too long, she would hoard it and then it would show up at the family yard sale. <laughs> and even when you bought it from her, sometimes if you left it lying around, you'd have to buy it back from her several weeks later. And then it got really confusing as to who whose was what and but she was she was always doing those yard sale things. And I thought that was that was kind of unique. Then we uh, we had these art sales too. Sometimes when we'd get really bored, mom would have to uh, mom always uh, you never wanted to say you were bored around our house because you would get put to work right away or it, it except I figured out how to get out of it one time when I put the, uh, the mom told me to mow the grass one time and I I really wanted to go down to the Gulf with one of my friends who could who could drive so we had this old lawnmower that looked like it wouldn't work and it was this old Yazoo lawnmower that was really heavy and I, uh, I parked it outside the window and I got a bunch of firecrackers and I, and I put them under the uh, under the lawnmower, and and I lit them. And that thing, you know, went, it was this Yazoo was a big iron looking thing, and it went. All these firecrackers went off under there. And uh, a mom came running the door, and I was backed away from the lawnmower, and I, thought, I don't know what happened, mom. I tried to start it, and she's like, "Just leave it alone. Don't touch it. Just." What, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Just do whatever you want. Just leave that. Leave it there until your father gets home. So I got away before y'all found the firecracker. But uh, that was that was probably one of the only times I got out of doing my chores. And we had lots of chores. Most of mine, to this day, I cannot rake and mow a yard. I just can't stand it. And for some reason, it seemed like it took us all weekend to do that. And me being the oldest guy. I was always, always in charge of rake, raking and mowing the yard. I don't even think people rake anymore. But why did we have to do that? And, uh, and I, to this day, I still can't. Uh, I hate doing yard work because of that. I was just burnt out. Other than that, we all had to uh, empty trash cans. Uh, we all had waste baskets in all the rooms. We would go around and empty those out. But that was mostly the girls. I had to feed the animals. And as I mentioned, we had a lot of animals. One of them, we had a chicken coop with a lot of these, a lot of chickens in it. And my job was to feed the chickens, and I hated those chickens. <laughs> Mostly because I've always been scared of roosters. 
And we had this really mean rooster in there that we called Leghorn. And mom wanted me to go check for chicken eggs, so I couldn't just throw the feed into the coop. I had to go in there and make sure that the hens hadn't laid any eggs. And in order to do that, I had to get past Leghorn. And he was always, it's like he, as soon as I approached the pen, he would be kind of shadowing me along the inside of the fence, just watching me. And I'd stop, and he would stop, and I'd stop, and he would stop. And I would talk to him, you know, like Leghorn. I mean, you better back off. <laughs> Leghorn, you've had it today. If you can so much as get close to me. And I had these conversations with him. And... But he was crazy. He would crow all day long from like sunup to sundown. He was like a, an insane POW or something. And uh, I would go into the pen. Somehow I'd figure out how to get leg worn around the other side of the coop. Then I'd run in and shove myself in there and check for eggs. And then, um, then somehow the raccoon got in and, and killed all the chickens. I get somebody left the gate open. I don't know how that <laughs> Mom didn't trust me to feed the chickens again after that. Um, we had lots of had lots of rabbits, and what are some of the other weird pets we had, Mom? Well, lots of dogs. The doghouse is still in my yard and has 14 names written on it. Yeah. yeah. That terrifying it must be for any new dog that comes. But <laughs> well, we never had any inside dogs. All of our dogs. I think all of our dogs just were stray dogs that walked up when we started feeding them. And our 98 out in front of our house was, uh, I mean, sometimes cars would go really fast there along that road, especially at night. There weren't a lot of cars, but when there were cars, it could be like a drag strip. And so most of our dogs ended up getting hit by a car at one point or another. And so our dog house had names all over it. And uh, as soon as one dog would die, another one would wander up, and uh, we'd start feeding it, and that would that would be the new dog, and it would be around for a while. And uh, lots of cats too. I don't know why we had so many cats, but ever since we, I remember the cats would always fall off the wharf and drown too. <laughs> I remember I remember that we always had dead cats washed up on the beach. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. <laughs> Uh, and Mom, you got stuck underneath the house one time trying to get the cats, didn't you? I did. One of my cats had had kittens under the house, and the house was only about that high. My mom would have to crawl under and fix the pipes. And all the children went to school, and I thought, well, I'm going to crawl under that house and get those kittens. So I put on a camouflage suit and a camouflage hat, and I crawled under, couldn't get the kittens, and I was coming out backwards and I got stuck. <laughs> and I couldn't go up back under and I couldn't go out. And I had to wait till the school bus came home and the boys had to dig me out. <laughs> yeah, there was always, always something going on. And uh, I wanted, if anybody has any questions they want to ask me about any of the books or uh, the Magazine articles? Yes, ma'am. The um, sister Angie, what does she do now besides yard sales? Oh, Alice. Alice. Alice, I'm sorry. Well, Alice was a teacher at Bayside for a while, and now she uh, has two children. And she's a, a stay at home mom. She's not working, is she? And she's a stay at home mom. She lives in Fairhope. I think it should be a corporate salesman. <laughs> she's, she's very, uh, very organized and helps dad with, with his books sometimes she's that she's that type she she's person. yeah she's a numbers person i just want to let you know the next time you want want to run away from home you do not tell your mother <laughs> <laughs> right yeah next time i run away from home i'm not going to tell i'm not going to tell anybody but mainly I, I guess i think i just wanted some sympathy and mom had no sympathy she uh yeah she was I used to have the picture that they took, and I'm standing there in front of my tent scowling. And uh, but I don't know where it is. It's I wish I could find it. Look up. Yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> Where's your camera? 
My camp in the Delta is up in uh, Chucky Bay. And when I, I moved to Mobile, when I got back from college, I moved to Mobile and I wanted a place to get back on the water. And the closest place for me was up in the Delta. And I had never been up there before. I'd grown up on the Bay and had never thought about going into the Delta. So I went up there one day and was fascinated with it. I was fascinated with how somebody could build a camp up there and get all the lumber. It was just up my alley. And so I wanted to transport a bunch of lumber up there and build a camp. And then uh, Hurricane George came along, right, not long after I'd started. And so I had all the lumber I wanted on the beach at one clear. <laughs> I collected it for weeks and marched it up there and spent about a year building this camp. And while I was building it, just the people I met up there, it was a lot of fun. Like my neighbors, the first time I met, these are the kind of people that are up there. Uh, the first time I met my neighbors, I, he was building his camp with his wife. And I walked in and their floor was just <laughs> plain plywood. There was nothing over it. So naturally I thought they were going to put some carpet down or some kind of laminate floor, you know, something. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, what are y'all going to do with that floor? He said, he said, well, we're just going to leave it like that. And his wife looked at me and said, I told him I ain't cleaning them hogs outside when it's raining. 